Today, it was announced that Pengu and Dev Marta will be one of the primary casting duos on the European League, which is really exciting. I actually cannot wait to see how they work as a duo. I know they've been practicing. I know they're both really excited for it, and I genuinely think they're going to do such an amazing job. But that, of course, means that Pengu is no longer casting with Parker, and that, of course, means that Parker needs a new duo, and that new duo is going to be me. Not just for the stage, but for, for the foreseeable future. I will be leaving the desk and moving to a caster position, which is really exciting. It's something that I have been thinking about for a while, but I've decided to move on over. And I really think to kind of get the full picture, I want to tell a little bit about the story of my time on the desk, the four years that I spent on the desk, why I didn't want to move off the desk for a very long time and why I wanted to stay on the desk. And then why I eventually decided that now is the proper time to switch up and to move over to move over to casting. So right off the bat, I want to say that I don't, I think a lot of analysts in esports in general, not even just Siege, but I think there have been analysts in the past who have looked at the job of being an analyst and basically just seen it as a stepping stone to getting somewhere else. Whether that means getting onto the casting booth, moving on to other roles, moving on to other games, moving on to positions as players or as coaches. I think a lot of people have seen the analyst position not as a destination, not as the goal, but as a step below where they want to be. And I honestly truly never saw the analyst desk that way. When I was on the desk, for me, that was always the focus. I was never trying to think, how do I get off the desk to go do this role? I was never trying to think, how do I go change to be this? How do I be that? My focus truly from day one till literally the end of stage one was how do I be the best analyst that I can be? And I honestly think that philosophy came um, from a conversation I had with the GOAT, Jess GOAT, back at the Six Invitational in Sweden. When she kind of put this idea into my head that there's nothing lesser about being an analyst, which like maybe sounds awesome obvious now, at least it does to me, but I think for a long time, this just wasn't the philosophy that a lot of people ran with. Back at SI 2022, I remember though, at the end of the event, having a conversation with Jess Goat herself about being an analyst and about how important it was to prioritize being an analyst for the sake of being an analyst and not just using it as a stepping stone, I guess, to, to, to get somewhere else. And that conversation has always stuck with me. And for that reason, I kind of always have focused on being the desk analyst guy, focused on being the best analyst I could, not worried as much about transitioning away, even though it would have been a natural transition. I mean, before I was an analyst, I was a caster. I started casting when I was 16 years old. Um, and I casted, only ever casted from 16 to 20. 21. Obviously not professionally, but I casted Team Fortress 2 for like three years. I casted Rainbow Six Tier 2 for a couple of years. The only reason I even became an analyst in the first place was because that's where the spot was. When they were creating the North American League in 2020, there was a spot for the analyst desk. I believe that spot came when um, when Emzo decided to leave the talent game. And so there's a spot on the desk. There were no spots on the caster booth. And Ubisoft reached out to me. They said, hey, do you want to come on the desk? And I said, yes. And the the reason I said yes to that was because it was never my goal to be a Rainbow Six caster. Never in my life was it my goal to be a Rainbow Six caster. I'm a very goal-oriented person. I like to see something that I could work towards, and I work towards that goal, and then I eventually hit it. That's how I've lived my life for years and years and years now. And back when I was grinding tier two, my goal was never cast the NAL. My goal was I want to work in esports full time. I want my main source of income to come from esports. I love esports. I want to be doing esports full time. So when I was offered the full time gig of the North American League, it was an obvious yes, even though it wasn't the role that I was initially looking for. It wasn't the role I initially saw myself as. It wasn't the role I was particularly good at at the very beginning. I felt like it was it was absolutely the right call to take it. And I'm so glad that I did. And I'm so uh, happy with how it's gone over the last four years. But for the longest time, my goals were join the North American League in some way, work in esports in some way. Initially, I got my spot as an analyst. And my goal initially became, okay, you know what? I got to work to be the best analyst that I can be. I gotta work as hard as I can to get good at this thing, to uh, learn the game as much as I can, to learn the ins and outs of being an analyst as much as I can. And that eventually manifested in a couple of key steps. I wanted to be an analyst at the major. And then the Mexico major happened, then I did that. I wanted to be an analyst at SI. 
and then SI22 happened, and I did that. Then I decided, okay, well, the next step, I want to be an analyst for SI Grand Final. And then SI2023, I did that. I did the Montreal SI Grand Finals with Milos and Dev Marta and uh, Fresh. And then I said, okay, at that point, the goals almost kind of ran out. After SI 2023 inside of Montreal, I worked the Grand Finals on the desk. I, I worked W7M versus G2. And as talent, once you've worked SI Grand Finals, that's kind of the last goal to hit, right? That's kind of the last benchmark. And it didn't much help for my motivation that that was also the last SI being run by Faceit. After that, we were having a big change in the scene where we were going to be moving over towards working with Blast. And I have a very good relationship with Blast right now. I really enjoy working with Blast. There's a lot of things I like about Blast. But when Blast came into the scene, it was no secret that there were a lot of problems from the talent side of things. I think a lot of the initial offers that talent got from Blast were not particularly to talent's liking. I think there was a lot of fear at that SI because we got a lot of our Blast offers at Six Invitational 2023. And there was a lot of concerns and a lot of problems that people had with those offers. And so it felt like it was going to be a time of pretty big change. I also felt at that time that I didn't really have as much room to grow. Like there was not as many goals. Like there was really no goal for me to hit after that. Sure, I could still become a better analyst. I was not perfect at that moment. And I think I knew that. But the combination of Blast coming in and me running out of goals to hit, running out of objectives to mark off my list, I think was the first time that my motivation really got hit as an analyst. I kind of lost the passion to be on the desk. That passion also was hurt because I felt like at the Six Invitational for a moment, I was looking at the at the SI Grand Finals desk and I was like, great, I made it. But there's no other North Americans on the entire desk. The host was from Europe, one of the other analysts was from Europe, and one of the other analysts was from, was from Australia. At the time, my desk was me, Doa, and Jacob. And so I had it in my mind that, you know what, maybe there's no more goals for me to hit, but maybe I can help work with the rest of my desk, get more North American talent onto the SI Grand Finals desk. That was like the goal I came up with in my head to replace the initial goal. But immediately that was snapped because what you saw is 2024 stage one run by Blast. Blast comes in and what do they do? Well, they immediately change everything. For the North American League 2023, if you look at the fucking casting credits for NAL, our hosts were Doa, Janeiro, and the analysts were Cookie, Demo, and me. I was getting a new person on the desk for the NAL basically every single week. I was on the North American League uh, on every play day, but like Doa was in for most of it and then he swapped out for Janeiro. We started with cookies, then that swapped out for demo. Then we went back from Janeiro to Doa, and then fucking during the LCQ, which was basically the same as the NAL, then Brimstone came in. So it's like I was working with three different hosts, two different analysts, a bunch of them were brand new. The only person from the face it days coming over was Doa. And so I felt like this goal that I had of like, well, I'm gonna boost up the rest of the NA talent was impossible. Because every single week, somebody was being swapped out, somebody was being swapped in. There was no consistency. Meanwhile, in Europe, they had a desk of Milos, Fresh, and Fabian, who weren't on every single week, but they certainly had a lot more time together than the North American talent did, at least in terms of the desk. I, I think Europe proved that that was a formula that could work, and I think Europe was doing a really good job, and I was frustrated at that point that I still couldn't replicate that in North America, that I couldn't have that consistency in NA. And so for a long time, I think right at the start of stage one after SI, my motivation was quite, quite low. But then two things happened that kind of switched that for me and allowed me to get my motivation back to be a desk analyst. The first thing that happened was that Janeiro came onto the North American League desk. And I got to talk to Janeiro. I remember one conversation I had with her uh, in the car. It was the whole group. It wasn't just me and her, but it was the whole group coming back from the studio one night after NAL. I remember she was talking about her goals, being an esports host, and how she wanted to be like the best host in all of esports, and how she wanted to be all of these things, and how she had all these aspirations. And that kind of made me remember what it was like to have motivation, if that makes sense. It made me think about, oh shit, you know what? It is kind of hype. To be able to have goals, to be able to have wants to be able to push for great things and I kind of wanted to get that back. The other thing that happened during that time and this is going to be a bit of a detour was that Valorant started and I remember being in my hotel room in Denmark and watching the very first play day the very first opening desk segment of VCT America's stage one and I'll play you just the intro here and you'll kind of see what I saw uh, back during those days. The path to champions begins right here. Heroes will rise legends will be created and then 10 of the best teams in North America, Latin America, and Brazil will meet on this stage to do battle in this arena every single week. And, 
Uh, guys, you know, I'm trying to get all like, enthusiastic about this, create this like dramatic intro, and all I see in Twitch chat is, where's Tarek? Where's little bro? Is Tarek asleep? You know what, let's just get this out of the way right now. Bring him in! Ooh. Yeah, Ooh. yeah, that's right. Ooh. There's your Tarek now. Here he is. Go ahead, wait to the camera, Tarek. So this is how they started the show. And this desk analyst segment ends up being about half an hour long, I believe. And I watched this desk analyst segment in its entirety. I remember after watching this segment, sitting down and thinking to myself, holy shit, that segment was better than every Rainbow Six desk segment that's ever been done. By far. And it's it, it kind of clicked in me that, you know what, I may have hit the peak of like Rainbow Six analysts. I may have worked the Six Invitational Grand Final. But there's so much work to be done. There are so many more heights that could be hit. And if I just look outside the Rainbow Six sphere, there's so much cool shit that other people are doing that we could reach towards. And I think that Valorant broadcast has a lot of resources that Rainbow Six doesn't have, has never had, and maybe never will have. But I still thought that there was room for the analyst desk and Siege to grow. And obviously they had a bit of a goofy intro, but they honestly hit like a lot of really in-depth and interesting attention-grabbing notes in that segment that I really wanted to replicate. And I think the three that did this uh, intro desk mean me, uh, Bren and Golden Boy, three of the best esports talent in the world, did a fantastic job and really sparked my motivation more than anything to try to elevate the desk and get back to being a top tier analyst. Well, not back to being a top tier analyst, but raise the bar at least is uh, is the way I'd put it. But that wasn't exactly a concrete goal. And this year in 2023, one thing that happened was that Mimi, the analyst here on the left, won esports analyst of the year. And that combined with the things that I knew about the esports awards. I know a a lot of people don't give an absolute fuck with the esports awards, but for talent, especially back, you know, in 2023, last year, I truly think they were a really big deal. I knew some of the people that were on the esports awards panel. I've heard people talk about processes they go through to pick talent and and the thought that goes into them. And I truly thought that they were making genuinely really good decisions about who they wanted to nominate and who they were giving awards to. Mimi, a perfect example. And so I decided in my head that it was gonna be my goal to get nominated for the esports awards on the analyst desk. Not because I necessarily cared about the, I mean, I certainly did, I, I won't lie, right? I don't think it was primarily because I wanted the praise and the shiny award. I didn't even really care about winning it, but just because I saw it as the next benchmark, the next goal to hit, the next step in the career, something finally I could reach for beyond working SI Grand Finals. And I didn't get nominated in 2023, and that was fine. I didn't think I deserved it. But over the course of this summer, as I'm sure you'll be aware if you're following the esports scene, it was announced that the esports awards got bought by Saudi Arabia, and they were being worked into the esports World Cup. Now, esports World Cup is its own bag of worms that I'm not going to unpack here. I know everybody's got their opinions on it. For transparency, I worked the esports World Cup last year. I turned down my offer at the esports to work the esports world cup this year and i turned down the offer i got two years ago so i'm all over the place but ultimately i think just the fact that the award show was being held where it was i knew for a fact that there would be a lot of people who would be very deserving of the esports analyst of the year award and all the awards who would refuse to participate who wouldn't accept their nominations who wouldn't accept the award had they got it who would refuse to uh, acknowledge the awards in any way shape or form and you saw that in the initial announcement when the esports awards were announced parker famously dropped out of the of the esports panel a lot of former winners said, fuck this, you know, we don't want our awards anymore. And that kind of crushed the idea that this could still be like a goalpost for me. That this could still be something to shoot for in, in the world of being an esports analyst. Because now, even if I was willing to look past the Saudi stuff, even if I wanted to do that, the fact that I knew there were some top people who wouldn't be able to look past that stuff kind of made the award show meaningless. The second you inject politics into it, the entire power of the award show, the whole point of the awards being what they were, kind of became irrelevant. And so on the day they announced that Saudi was buying the award show, I kind of realized that I no longer had any goals of being an esports analyst. And the motivation, I think, at that point left to the point where it didn't really come back. Now, thankfully, that motivation left before I even did another gig on the desk. The announcement came in the summer off season after the, the Manchester Major. And so, you know, it, it went that way that I kind of didn't have a goal anymore for the analyst desk. And I looked at my options. I said, you know what? I've been really enjoying streaming. I really enjoy my community. I really enjoy my chat. I'm going to set my new goal to hit Twitch Partner. I'm going to start focusing on content goals rather than esports goals. I was not at this point planning to leave the desk in any way, shape, or form. I was still in my head going to show up, do the analyst desk, do the best that I could. But was I going to be thinking about improving on the desk every single day? Was I going to be thinking about other top desk talent and how I could emulate and improve to be better than them? Probably not. I was going to show up to work, do my best, and put most of my thought and energy into pushing content goals and trying to be the best streamer, TikToker, and YouTuber 
sure that I could. Now, I do have to rewind the clock a little bit. I have to go back to the NAL days. There was a day in the NAL 2022 where Pangu was sick, or he, was, he, he wasn't able to come into the LA studio and work a day on the desk. It was whenever Tommy came in. Thomas was an analyst here, and effectively what Face It decided during that day was that instead of getting a replacement, an a, a replacement caster for Pangu, it was going to be easier for them to get a replacement analyst for me, put Thomas on the desk, and move me to cast a day with Parker. And this was not the first time I'd ever, it was this day. It's not the first time I'd ever casted with Parker, but it was the first time in a long time, and it was the first time since I had been a full-time esports uh, commentator. Here we are. Jesus Christ, we look different. <laughs> And I really came into that play day thinking, this will be fun. I'm good friends with Parker. This will be a good time. I'll jump in. I'll cast a couple of games. And then I'll go back to the desk. Wait a Whoa. minute. Who's that? Whoa. Wait, Jesse, what are you doing over there? Jesse, you're alive? I've sneaked over to the other desk. I've run snuck. across the studio. Snuck. You snuck. I snuck? Snuck. You snuck, snuck over. Bro, We're I off to a great start. <laughs> I but I think as this play day went on, we were really... Sh I was really surprised with how well the cast went. I think the cast went really, really well. I had a lot of fun with it. Parker had a lot of fun with that cast. Face it really liked the cast. Ubisoft really liked the cast. And the viewers really liked the cast. Basically on all fronts, the response to this casting was very positive. And it was by no means an immediate, you know what, we're all gonna switch gears. Parker and I are colluding to cast together ASAP. But after this, after these two play days that Parker and I casted together, we did have a conversation that was like, you know what, at some point in the future, maybe if we ever move on from Rainbow Six Siege, maybe, you know, if things turn out that way, we could one day be a duo. That was the first time that conversation really came up all the way back in like fucking July 2022. So the seed was planted at that point, but at that point I was still very motivated to be an analyst desk. Parker and Pengu were still a bit of a new duo who wanted to keep working together and who, who had a lot of goals to keep uh, achieving as a, a, as a duo. Pengu was living in North America. Pengu has talked a lot on Twitter about his reasons for switching up uh, this stage. But at the time, Pengu was living in North America. He was living in Las Vegas, so there was no real time zone issues for him to work the North American League. So it didn't make sense at the time to switch up. And then throughout the years since uh, 2022 till now, it was something that Parker and I always talked about, especially as we moved uh, remote to Copenhagen, and especially since the time zone got worse for Nick. It was something that certainly came up a couple of times, but it was never something that we were both ready to pull the trigger on. Either Parker wanted to keep working with Nick, I wanted to keep working at the desk, some combination in between, etc, etc. But after the Esports Awards announced where they would be hosting their gig. And at some point during the summer, Parker reached out to me a couple of weeks ago. And Parker knew kind of how I was feeling about the whole Esports Awards and my motivation. And Parker basically said, hey, listen, Nick really wants to go to Europe. Nick really doesn't want to work on the North American League anymore because it's terrible for his time zone. He tweeted as much today if you if you saw Nick's tweet. And Parker said, do you want to make the swap? Officially asked me, like, do you want to finally lock it down? Let's do it. Let's change to being a casting duo. And uh, I said, yes. I said, you know what? It's the perfect time. I, I don't really want to be an analyst anymore. Not that I didn't want to be an analyst, but I didn't have any more goals being an analyst. And I figured like not only would switching to casting give me new goals to hit, give me new stuff to achieve. I want to cast a major. I want to cast a major grand finals. I want to cast SI. I want to cast SI grand finals, et cetera, et cetera. But it also gave me more time to focus on the goals that I still wanted to achieve. It gave me more time to stream. It gave me more time to make TikTok. This is all stuff that was harder to do as an analyst because I was flying back and forth between Edmonton and Philadelphia. Philadelphia every single week. And that's two days out of my week that I basically can't make content alongside the two days of the week that I was already working the NAL desk. Four days a week where I can't make content, only three days a week to stream was obviously a lot tougher to be, you know, to be full focused on streaming. So honestly, this summer, everything just kind of lined up. It has given me a lot more motivations to work on being a caster. I've known for probably a month now, a month and a half, something like that, that I was going to be moving over to casting. And I'm really excited for it. I'm pumped. I actually think there's a lot that I can do as a caster. I may not be the best caster in the entire world right off rip and I really hope that you'll keep that in mind when you're typing your messages in Twitch chat. I really hope you're not too mean. But I, I'm excited. I believe I can do well as a caster. I, it's something I've done before. I've done it with Parker before. I think it will be something that I have a lot of room to grow in. And I think my brand of like broadcasting that is filled with statistics, filled with fun facts will lend itself really well to casting. I want to put out a new style of color casting that I don't think we have a ton of in Rainbow Six, which is more focused on the statistics, more focused on the fun facts, almost like a traditional sports color commentator. Not quite. I want to keep some banter with Parker. I want to continue doing the analysis part of it, talking about why I think strats did and didn't work. And so I think, you know, there, there's a lot of room for experimentation. I really hope that you'll watch our games. I hope you won't mute our streams when Parker and I come on. I hope you'll give us a chance because I really think that we can do a good job on the, on the casting desk and I'm excited to get started.